I shot my mum. Those are words that you don't usually expect to hear as a 911 operator, but even more so when the words are coming from a 10 year old boy's mouth. Hey Coffee and Crimers, I'm your host, Belle Fagan, and today we're gonna go back to January 2nd, 2011, at around 6 p.m. in Big Prairie, Ohio, where an argument between a mother and her 10-year-old son escalated into a deadly encounter. The 911 dispatcher immediately had police head to the McVeigh home. Inside, they found 46-year-old Deborah McVeigh face down on her living room floor with a gunshot wound to the head. Feeling for a pulse, officers declared her DOA. Now, her youngest child, 10-year-old Joseph, had been the one to call and confess to the murder, all witnessed by his 15-year-old sister, Shauna. They must have had an argument about something major, right? It needed to have been the monumentalist of arguments of all time. It had to be just for him to see red and shoot her dead, right? Wrong. Wood for their fire. Firewood is what they argued about. His mum wanted him to bring in some firewood to the house and apparently he didn't want to. So while we let the cause of their argument process in our minds, let's turn to how slash why did a 10 year old even get hold or have a gun? Are you ready? This is equally as crazy, in my opinion. Just a few weeks before this horrific incident, Deborah McVeigh had actually argued with her estranged husband about at least six guns being in her house, all of which were given to the 10-year-old boy, Joseph, by him. Now, I know views of guns in the UK versus the USA differ a lot, but surely, 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 Even the most pro-gun person can't see it as a good idea to give a child a weapon, let alone multiple. I just, I honestly do not understand that mentality as a parent myself. So had the reason that he shot his mother in complete cold blood truly been 100% about a chore that he simply didn't want to do? Did it come completely out of left field? Now, Joseph did have another older brother called Joshua who wasn't in the home at the time, but him, Shauna, and even school administrators all went on record saying that Joseph had been exposed to domestic abuse between his mum and dad before they'd split. And they also alleged that Deborah was both emotionally and verbally abusive to Joseph. Now, their trailer home in rural Ohio was described by police as being cluttered, unkempt and downright dirty. And Joseph had many, many times in the past shown both anger and aggression. So for a couple of examples, in 2006, he'd had an altercation with the driver of his school bus. In 2007, when he was only six, he'd taken a dustpan and hit a member of staff repeatedly at his school after he had caused a disruption in his classroom. But school administrators did say that he was a polite and nice kid and those outbursts only ever happened when he felt provoked. Now, Deborah and Joseph's dad, Michael, like I said, they were estranged, but they had actually only separated a couple of weeks before the shooting. And already Michael had a warrant out for failing to pay child support. There was, that was a whole other issue. I think there was quite a, a lot of maybe other criminal activities that his dad was known for or wanted for. But their separation had caused Joseph's angry outbursts to become way more frequent. So going back to that fateful night, Deborah had asked Joseph to go outside, like I said, and get some firewood. Joseph had refused. A huge fight started. Joseph allegedly then told his 15-year-old sister, Shauna, that he was sick and tired of fighting with their mum. So he went to his bedroom, walked over to the gun rack mounted on his wall and grabbed one of the guns. When I say that, I still can't believe I'm talking about a 10-year-old child here. A 10-year-old went to his bedroom and grabbed one of his guns. Wasn't locked away wasn't hidden, didn't have a key, needed to get into it. It was literally just hanging on a mount on his bedroom wall. It just still blows my mind. Joseph then went back to the living room, aimed and pulled the trigger, all while his sister watched on, 
begging him not to shoot her next. He didn't and instead walked out of the house and over to their neighbours, which is where the 911 call was made. He was arrested and charged with delinquency by virtue of committing murder, which is basically just saying he was charged with murder, but as a juvenile. He entered a denial plea, which is the juvenile equivalent of not guilty. And initially he was found not fit to stand trial, one, due to his age, but also after two psychologists stated that he was just completely mentally unfit and was suffering from anxiety and depression, as well as a learning disability. He was having trouble talking about his mum's death, which they said obviously affected his ability to talk to his lawyers about his defence. They also both said that Joseph would benefit far more from counselling. He had spent a year being held at the Richland County Juvenile Detention Centre, but was then transferred to a residential treatment facility. In August 2013, the same judge that had sentenced him to the Juvenile Detention Centre reviewed the case and ordered Joseph to continue his stay at the residential facility, saying that moving him back to a juvenile detention centre would actually hinder the progress he'd made with his therapist. At that ruling, he also said, and I quote, It was a terrible decision to allow a kid with impulse control access to a gun. Yes, 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 judge. Yes, I completely agree with you. It was a terrible decision to allow a kid with impulse control access to a gun. Can we say that a little bit louder, please? Because honestly, I am still in shock. So like I said, Joseph had six guns in his room given to him by his father, Mike. The 22 caliber that he had used to kill Deborah actually belonged to his paternal grandfather originally. The judge carried on and said, this is just irresponsible parenting. So making that ruling, I would say, suggested that the judge wanted him at some point to be able to reintegrate into society successfully, regardless of his past and of this crime. He also said, Joseph is going to be behind us in Walmart or at the gas station one day. Joseph's therapist also spoke, saying that he, Joseph, is working through his trauma and that their goal was to help him work through it, right or wrong, and help him to become a productive adult one day. Now again, the ruling of the judge would suggest that he would stay in that facility until he was 21, which would be the maximum, and then rejoin society. Well. He's over 21 now, but there is no further record of a new trial, which to me would suggest that he is free and no longer in the prison system. Now, there's actually very little, if any, information on his whereabouts. And because juvenile records are sealed, it's almost impossible to find out any more. So I literally could not find anything about whether he has been released, if he's reintegrated into society, anything, if he's even still alive. I honestly could not find anything. But it did make me wonder how his sister Shauna must be feeling today. As at the time of the ruling, she pleaded with the judge to give him the harshest sentence possible. Now, on her behalf, her lawyer described Joseph as a delinquent who didn't murder his mother because of abuse, but instead because she stood in his way. They did, however, accept the judge's ruling. So now to me, she was there. Not only did she live with him, but she was there when he went and got the gun and shot at his mum. So out of everybody, she would have seen his state of mind in that moment. Obviously, none of us truly know what's actually going on in regards to mental well-being, but she would have had far more of an idea. He took her mum from her. So the fact that she pleaded with the judge to really give him a harsh sentence makes me wonder that if he is out there in society again, are they having anything to do with each other? Have they reconnected? Has she forgiven him? I would love to find out more about this. But like I said, because it was a juvenile case, it's sealed and I can't find any information about any of them. I can't find any information about the father either, because really, in my again, in my opinion, I do feel that he should be culpable. Again, I don't know the laws. I don't know the laws in the US about guns and children or who it needs to be registered to, etc. But I do feel that Michael McVeigh should have had some consequences for giving his 10-year-old son not one, but six 
guns. So to me, this really is a complex case. He obviously had behavioural issues. I'm not denying that. But at 10, are those behavioural issues his fault? Because generally at that age, Anything to do with behavioural is either due to being on the autism spectrum or having some other sort of disability, mental disability, or it's parenting issues. So like I just said, either way, guns should not have been given to a child that wasn't operating at a higher maturity level and one who could cope with that level of responsibility. It is just a tragic, tragic ending. I'd love to know your thoughts, so why don't you head over to the Cup of Coffee and Crime podcast discussion group on Facebook by clicking the link in the description of today's case. Until next time, stay safe.